Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Anna, and I'm with the New Mexico Small Business Development Center. Today, we have Vic Berniclot joining us, who is a SCORE certified mentor specializing in technology and business management. Vic will present Putting Your Business Ideas into Practice. Thanks so much for joining us, and without further ado, I'll hand it over to you, Vic. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to what I think should be an enjoyable opportunity for you to learn something about converting your business idea into a profitable company. Just for background purposes, just so you'd be aware, uh, I started a couple of businesses with my wife and son many years ago, and we got them up to about 30 employees and a couple million in annual sales before turning them over to our son a few years ago. And he's been doing very well and expanding the businesses as well. So I've uh, been there, done that, worn out my kneecaps in front of bankers, you know, that routine. And so I want to give you both the benefits of academics, which I've taught at the university uh, business school, as well as uh, in uh, having experienced a lot of business uh, challenges. So let's get on with the efforts. Uh, please uh, mute your audio if you haven't have done that. Uh, make sure you fit the window, which I'm sure you've done these before, so there's nothing new. On the questions, if you don't mind, if you would jot down your questions, and hold them till the end, we, because we've got so much material I wanna kind of pack in and I can give you the commitment right now, we will stay as long as necessary to answer every one of your questions. So be sure you jot down the questions because it's important that you understand what the information is that we're gonna be presenting. There's some information here on COVID-19, just some of the uh, links that in the event you're interested in that, uh, there's a lot of information on that area. Uh, SBDC does a super job in terms of training. This is just one. There's so many other training opportunities. And when I started a business like you, I tried to get as much information as possible. This is a fantastic opportunity for you to get that. Be sure you avail yourself of those training opportunities. And believe it or not, the best part of it is the price is right. So it only costs you your time. The other thing we're going to talk about is the importance of counseling or mentoring. Uh, very important, and SBDC does a super job in that particular area as well. Let's talk a little bit about putting your business ideas into practice. To take the idea and make a profitable company is a journey. It goes through various stages. There's at least three major stages, and you can break this up in a lot of different fashions, but the three major stages is that you have to have, one, a business idea that the customer will pay for. I can't tell you the number of people that I've worked with, and I've been in SCORE for many years to uh, mentor people who have an idea and they're saying they have to buy this idea. Well, I say, have you talked to them? No, but they have to buy it. Well, the important part is they don't have to buy it. There's so many businesses that have built it, opened their doors in hopes that the customers would come and they don't come and the customers go bankrupt. So we're gonna talk about how do you avoid the problem of bankruptcy? Second part is once you have an idea that the customers will pay for, is you got to start laying out the plans. And we're going to be talking about how to plan for your business. And the third part that we're going to be dwelling a lot of time on is how do I convert that plan into a profitable company? What kind of administrative financial arrangements do I have to have? So we're going to focus on number three. The first one is a business idea. How do I know if my idea will sell? The easiest way is something called ask. Find out first, is there a market for what it is that you want to offer? A gentleman by the name of Steve Blank years ago in Silicon Valley, uh, who was an instructor at Stanford, uh, said that lots and lots of businesses go belly up because they don't make sure that they have customers before they open the doors. So he pushed something called a lean entrepreneurship. And the way you do that is you go out and you ask for what is the problem? Not, let me tell you what I'm selling. No, what is your problem in my particular area? And then you find a solution for that problem by testing it over and over with the customer until the customer says, hey, that's what I need. Then you start lining up other customers just like that. And you are on your way to a successful business. So there's your business idea. You find out by first finding the problem, finding a solution to that problem that the customers will pay for, 
and find enough customers, similar customers that are willing to pay for it. Then you get into business and only then do you start spending some of your money, not beforehand. The next step after you have your business idea that the customers will pay for is let's plan this arrangement. Well, there's a couple of ways you can do the planning. You can have a formal business plan that I'm sure many of you have heard about. A formal business plan can be a very thick document, take a lot of time. When I was in business, we bought, had to buy a like a half a million dollar building after we got the business really going. And uh, I had to come up with a business plan in order to get the loan from the bank. And uh, they loved a thick business plan. So I gave them what they wanted. They were the customers. So I gave them a very thick business plan lots of addendums, lots of attachments. They loved it because it was probably about an inch to through two inches thick, but I couldn't manage a business with that because it took way too long. It would take me forever to keep modifying. that. So what we've done in the meantime is come up with something called a lean business canvas plan. And that is a one pager. So let's talk about that for a minute. Here is the lean business plan. If, if you notice in the upper, left-hand corner, what do we have? We have a problem. The very thing I said you had to have in order to make the business successful. Once you understand the problem, we talked about having a solution for that problem, which you have tested with the customer. Then you got to decide who is my customer. Uh, I've, I've had clients uh, for, in Florida that say, well, everybody's my customer. And I said, well, then you better have an infinite amount of money to market to the whole world because uh, it'll take a huge amount of, oh, I don't have that money. Well, then I said, maybe you ought to start focusing on who you want to sell it to. Do I want to sell it to young people, old people? Do I want to sell it to business people, consumers? Do I want to sell it to certain parts of the geography? Uh, just in Albuquerque, no, in the Northeast Heights, no, in the South Valley, whatever it is, determine who your customers are and then focus on those customers. What is the method by which I'm going to deliver my product or service? Am I going to hand it to them? Am I going to mail it to them? Am I going to have them pick it up? Whatever. Decide that. What's my unique value proposition, the upper right-hand corner? And that value proposition is, am I going to give them a value greater than the money where they're giving me? Because if it isn't greater, they're not going to give me that money. So what's my value that I'm providing? Middle on the left is competitive advantage. Why would my customers buy from me and not from my competitors? If the competitors are already established, they're certainly not going to trust me with, as opposed to somebody who's already in the marketplace and has a reputation. So what's my edge? What do I bring in the way of additional value? How am I going to market this next block? How am I going to get their attention? Sales, how am I going to sell this? Am I going to sell this online? Am I going to have to st stand there in front of them? How do I do this? Manufacturers, reps, et cetera. What kind of resources am I going to have to have? Am I going to have to have buildings or storefronts? Or, and how much money am I going to have to have? In other words, how much people might have to have? Risks. Not enough people consider risks on the right-hand side in the middle. And that is, what could possibly happen to upset the apple cart? All you got to do is think through these things and say, what would I do if? A high probability those ifs will never come about. But if they do, you are all prepared. You can do a lot of it by designing around it. And if you can't, you can always buy insurance to cover it, but at least a risk assessment. Lower left, what's all of this converted into cost? How much is this going to cost me? We're going to talk about how you generate those costs and lay those out. Next block over, revenue. What kind of money is going to come in to offset that and recognize that I want to make a profit so my revenue has to be larger than my cost. Lower right-hand side, an area that people really don't pay enough attention to, and that is, what is success for me? Why am I doing this? Why do I even want to get into business for all the troubles and tribulations? In our case, we wanted to start a business so that our son would have the opportunity basically for a retirement account because I already had a retirement account. I had a full-time job that I was getting a retirement from before I started the business. So what is the success factor in your mind? If you don't have a success factor, the first bump that comes along says, hey, this is too much trouble and you walk away from it. So what is your success factor? Okay, now we've got the idea, we have a plan. How do we convert that plan into a business? We have to con consider something called an administrative platform or administrative envelope. We've got to convert that into something that works. 
let's take a look at what we consider a number of elements. So you can pick a lot of different elements in this platform, but what I want to do is go through and pick a set of them, the major ones, and I'd like to talk about each of those with you. First of all, we're going to talk about company name. What kind of organizational type? In other words, is this going to be a sole proprietor, an LLC, subchapter S, et cetera? Business administration, we're going to talk about a lot of elements in the business administration side in order to make this business profitable. We're about to the bugaboo of taxes. A lot of people kind of roll over their eyes and say, oh my gosh, I don't want to talk about taxes. The heck with that. I'll let somebody else. The problem is it's real. And if you don't pay attention to it, it will eat your lunch. Then we're going to talk about financial planning. Again, finances is important. And especially when we get to cash flow, cash flow is critical. Record keeping, why? We're going to address each of these. So let's talk first about company name. Name could be either general or descriptive. What do you mean general? Well, it could be general in the sense of a nondescript name. What? Well, things like Amazon, uh, things like uh, Etsy. Uh, things like uh, other generalized terms of that nature. But what's the advantages and disadvantages? Well, the advantage is that it is a term that gives you a lot of flexibility. So for example, Amazon. To begin with, Amazon could have picked a descriptive name. They could have said books online because they started selling books. Uh, and, but they selected the term Amazon. Well, it gave them the flexibility to do whatever they wanted to do, but who in the world is Amazon? They had to convince everybody that, that their name wasn't something that dealt with rivers in South America. So they converted that name into the minds of people by virtue of over and over and over hammering it, spending a lot of money, getting it into their minds that Amazon is who they are. The descriptive, on the other hand, you don't have to do that. Descriptive says things like, I'm roto Rooter. I am master charge, I am home security systems. It's obvious from the name what it is that you do. The problem is you don't have the flexibility. Let me give you a quick illustration. We started a company called Home Security Systems and did a lot of homes uh, for their security systems. But when they said, oh, this is wonderful, come now come on down to our business and do our business. But well, we knew that the business didn't wanna have a sticker on their business that said home security. So we said we had to make a second company called Industrial and Commercial Security System. So we had the beauty of a descriptive, the advantage, but the disadvantage is we lack the flexibility. So you got your choice between those two as to which you would like to have your company name. I'm going to make sure that nobody else has got that name, and we're going to talk exactly about that because you don't want to get sued for copying somebody else's name. So now let's talk about organizational type. A lot of different types of organizations. Specifically, the first one is sole proprietor. Sole proprietor is very easy. You and the business are the one and the same. Minimal, minimal paperwork. You can use your social security to take care of a lot of social security number, take care of your record keeping, a lot of that kind of stuff. The problem is liability. If you're a sole proprietor and you have a store and somebody stumbles in the store and sues the store because they banged up their knee, they could also sue you because you and the business are one and the same. So if you have equity in your home, your car, your retirement account or whatever, and the judge says, yes, in fact, a judgment is appropriate, they not only could take the assets out of the business, they can go get your personal ones. How do you cover that? Well, you cover it a couple of different ways. First of all, you could have a partnership, but a partnership is no more than a sole proprietor with more than one party. You can limit the, the problems in a, sober, in a partnership by having a partnership agreement so that each of you define what it is you're going to do. Because I've seen a lot of partnerships dissolve in divorce because they cannot get along because somebody said, well, you were going to do it. No, nah, you were going to. Big arguments. So there's advantages to a partnership. You split up the work, you have different capabilities. It's wonderful. But think if you're going to go that route of having a partnership agreement. This remaining problem is the liability. You're both liable for the other's efforts. So if one partner goes off the track and runs out there and runs up a lot of bills, the second partner who has nothing to do with that is also liable in that partnership. How do you get rid of this liability issue? Well, one of the ways is to come up with what's called a limited liability company, an LLC. An LLC has the advantage in that if you run that company as a company, 
you can avoid the liability. In other words, they could get the assets if the judge agrees that judgment is appropriate to get the assets from the company, but they can't come after you personally. At least that's the way the courts have been ruling so far. Uh, the disadvantage is that you have to go through more paperwork, and we're going to talk exactly about how to go through that process. It's not very tough, but there is some paperwork involved. Subchapter S gives you some advantage in that it is something that is a little more paperwork. We recommend you consider doing it with a lawyer. Uh, number three, the limited liability company you can do on your own, and we're going to talk exactly how to do that. Subchapter S really gives you the advantage that you could sell stock. In other words, instead of going out and borrow the money, you could say, hey, I'm going to sell 10% of this company to my cousin Joe, and he's going to give me 50000 and uh, I'm going to have that as my initial capitalization because I've shared part of the company with Joe. So sub, sub chapter S, you can have stock, limited liability company. There is no stock, it's just partial interest. There's something called a C corporation, but that is for the big guys. This is for the General Motors and the GEs, et cetera. Let's talk about how to form the LLC. Why? The LLC seems to be the dominant one of choice in New Mexico and the, the clients that I've worked with because you can get it fairly quickly. They cost us $50, you do it online. And we'll talk about how you protect that liability. You have to have a formal name. How are we gonna get that name? We're gonna talk about that. You have to have a registered agent. We'll talk about that. You're gonna file orders, articles of organization in the process and an optional operating agreement. So we'll talk about each of these. Let's go to name first. In the name that we select, and we have, we're going to show you how you can verify that you don't have the conflict of that. You always want to put after the name, comma, LLC or LC or L.L.C. or L.C. But to make sure that it's clear that you're talking about a company that has that liability protection. Whenever you sign for the company, make sure that you always put down your signature. And then your position, whether you're the president, whether you're the chairman, whether you're the chief cook and bottle artist, it doesn't make any difference. Joe Blow, president, ABC company, or ABC LLC. That's the way you want to solve for it. Don't sign for it as Joe Blow, period, uh, because that makes infer that you're signing as an individual, not for the company. Always want to make sure that nobody else has that name by going to this portal. And incidentally, you don't have to worry about jotting down a lot of notes because as I understand it, SBDC is going to send you copies of all of these view graphs. So you'll have all of the links available to you uh, and, and uh, you can just jump on those links. You can go to this portal and click on business search and say, I want to name my company uh, uh, Poinsettia Flower Specialists. And you can just put that in there. And if they say, here's Point Flower Specials, well, you know you can't use it because it already exists. If they come back and say, there is no such company, you say, great, now I know that I can use it. You have to have a registered agent. Who's a registered agent? A registered agent is somebody that the state of New Mexico can send a process of paperwork to. In other words, they have to have somebody who will accept the legal papers for the LLC. They will not accept a P.O. box. It has to be a physical address. But there is no problem with being your own agent. I've talked to people who said, I don't want my address to show up anywhere. I said, okay, then you want to hire an agent, and they will get the paperwork, and then they can get the paperwork to you in whatever fashion the two of you agree. But by and large, pretty much everybody, other than just a handful, say, I'll just have them send it to my address, and you just log on at, in, into the form as you are the registered agent. Articles of organization are no more than the form itself that you fill out in applying for the LLC. You fill that out and uh, including your name, including the effective date that you're filing, the period of duration, whether it's perpetual or if you want this only for a period of time, most people want it perpetual. You could leave it blank if it's a general business purpose, unless you have a specific, very specific business purpose. You have a name of the registered agent. And as I said, you can be your own. You have to put your email address and phone number down. That, that's optional if you don't want that, but later on, you know, we'll talk about it a little, a little more. The address of the principal place of business, if it's different than your mailing address. And is it going to be run by a manager or a member like yourself? 
So some people say, I'm going to form this LLC and I'm going to turn it over to Mary Smith and she's going to run the company for me. So they're going to want to know that. So you have to put that down, whether Mary's going to run it or you're going to run it. Uh, whether the LLC has only got one member or more, and if so, you want to specify. Uh, then who is the contact? Typically, you're the contact. And then there's something called an EIN and NAICS numbers. What in the world is that? Well, an EIN is the employer identification number that you get from the IRS, and we're going to give you a link. So why do I want to do that? Well, this is, in a sense, the license plate for you for the IRS. The IRS needs a number to reach you, just like they do for your social security for your personal taxes. They need to have a number for your business. It's free. We're going to give you the link. And there's a, even a tutorial on how to do it. It's very simple. And you'll get an EIN number. And if you want a bank account, I understand now that the bank wants the EIN number. So you ought to think, even if you're just going to be a sole member LLC, think about getting an EIN as well. The next number you're going to, when you fill out the form for the uh, LLC, they're going to say, put the NAICS number down. What is that? Well, that's a North American industrial code system. In other words, between Mexico, Canada, and the United States, several years ago, they agreed to have a whole large number of numbers that define all the different industrial groups and subgroups. So you can either go ahead of time and just Google NAICS numbers. It'll take you to the Department of Commerce website. And you can pick out the number that most closely represents your industry. Or if you forget about it and you're filling out the form, they give you a link to get back to the Department of Commerce and pick out your NAICS number to plug it in. Okay, Articles are all filled out online. There's no paper forms anymore. We're going to give you the link so that you can go online. And do it. You got to come up with 50 bucks. Typically, they want a, a credit card. If you're going to give them a check, you got to cut a deal way ahead of time so they have the check in hand before they will uh, allow you to finish the form. But almost everybody just uses a credit card. The operating agreement is a little different animal. It's not required, but advisable. Why? It turns out that an operating agreement tells everybody what you are going to do on how you're going to run the company. But it's internal to you. You have to, so some say, so why do I do it? Well, I personally formed an LLC. I did not have an operating agreement. But if you're going to have an a ongoing a company with uh, a uh, multiple people involved, I, I should have defined, I didn't do it for a consulting firm, which is just my own firm. That's why I fit the LLC. Uh, but if you have a ongoing company, you're going to see it grow. Think about having an operating agreement because it just says, okay, my business is going to be here. Here's the way I'm going to run it. But the big thing is, in the event of your demise, you fail to bust it, something happens to you, you don't survive, what do you want done with that business? Do you want my spouse to take it over? Do I want it sold? Do I want it just collapsed? Whatever I want with the business. Uh, so it's a way of setting up and operating the business. And you can look at that periodically so that it becomes a little bit of an operating standard for you. So just think about it, not required, don't need it outside of your own organization. Um, to form the LLC, you go online to the Secretary of State, and here is the link, which you'll, if you get copies of these, you'll see that, you can fill it out. And if you say, boy, this looks a little difficult, down at the bottom, they have set up a very nice uh, walkthrough, a video, that just click on that, and it walks you through the whole form, which I recommend you do that ahead of time. Go through that video, walk through that, and it'll tell you exactly how to do it. Go back and then fill out the form. Okay, we've talked about organizational types. Let's talk about business administration. Business administration has a lot of elements. Number one, a business checking account. So after, if you go LLC, after you have an LLC, after you have an EIN, uh, and you, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about something called a BTIN, which is a gross receipts tax number. You get a checking account in the name of the company. Why? Remember, we talked about that liability, and you had to run the company as on an arm's length relationship for that business. Well, what you want to do is you want to run every dollar that comes into the company into this checking account, and every dollar that goes out of the account, out, out of the business, goes out of that checking account. That way, that centers that business in that checking account. Now, if you turn around and you say, well, the company a little bit short, I'm going to put $50 in out of my pocket or 
Hey, man, I'm going to lunch. I'm going to take $50. Somebody who sues you and can prove that they can do what they call pierce the corporate veil. In other words, they're saying, hey, you and the business are one and the same, and you're more like a sole proprietor. Therefore, I get to sue you personally. So you didn't run that business in an arm's length relationship. I get to sue you and any assets that you have. So you want to make sure you do this on an arm's length relationship. If you have to put money into the company, no problem. What you do is you loan the company the money. I had to do that with our companies several times. Fill out a little promissory note that says, I, Vic Bernicla, hereby loan Home Security Systems $1,000 uh, at this kind of interest rate. And here's the payment return a date that I want it back. Signed, Vic Bernicla, President, Home Security Systems, LLC. So it's a formal document and everybody's happy as a lark because I started borrowing from the bank. I borrowed it for myself. No problem at all. But run the business on an arm's length relationship and protect your liability. Another thing to think about is a website. They say, my goodness, that's complicated. Well, there is free software that you can get online to create one-page websites. And why do you have to have that? It turns out if you go out selling something and somebody says, well, I don't know that they're a fly-by-night, they can quickly check your website. And you might have something on there which says, hey, here's where the business we're in, here's who's running, et cetera. And when you start going beyond the one page into a lot of other pages, you're going to have to start paying for the software. But to begin with a simple one, you can do that free. Do that. Think about it. Have business cards and something called a trifold. I'll tell you, you want to leave something with the people you talk to. Business cards, I think, is fairly obvious. The trifold is no more than a sheet of paper folded up into three pieces. And it says on there what it is that you do and gives a descriptor. And people will say, they may forget you, but they'll say, wait a minute, that guy was talking about mm, this, this. Oh, I remember he left me that try and open up the trifold. And there's the information. I'll get a hold of it. So it's a reminder of who you are and what you do. You say, well, trifold is kind of expensive. You can go on to Microsoft Word and they have various templates that you can just grab a template and generate your own trifold if you want to begin with. Insurance, there's both optional and mandatory. The mandatory is you're going to have to have workman's comp, workman's compensation, if you have three or more employees, or if you're in construction, even if you just have a single employee. Workman's compensation is no more than if the workman gets employee, gets hurt on the job. It's a form of insurance that uh, covers them while they are off the job, an injury that occurred on the job, not off the job, but on the job. That's an insurance. So you want to go to your insurance agents and get that. The, the optional insurance, I've always looked at insurance, is only get insurance for those things that you cannot afford to cover on your own. Thus, what we always did from the very first day was we had liability insurance. Uh, we bought liability insurance to cover any event somebody sued us for any kind of thing that might have happened on the job in their home or wherever we were at. Uh, so we did pay for liability insurance. So think about that. If you have property, whether you've got vehicles or a storefront or whatever, uh, and you want to insure that because, hey, I can't afford to get that banged up, then you buy property insurance. How do I price this stuff? Well, there's a lot of forms of pricing. Uh, the easiest uh, the, that a lot of people use is just a straight markup. I'm going to take whatever it costs me and I'm going to double it and that's my retail price. Or if I'm in a very competitive area, I may have to market up only 50% or 20%, 10%. It depends on who your competitors are. Are your competitors charging a very low price? You have to take a look and see, will my customers go to my competitors because they have a lower price? Do I have to charge a lower price than my competitors? Not necessarily. If you can show that I'm offering a value, remember we talked about the unique value proposition? If I'm offering a value greater than my competitors, and I can show that because when we were in business, we told everybody, we're not the cheapest place. If you want something cheap, you need to go to our competitors. But here's what we offer you, which is more than our competitors. And that here's why our prices are a little bit higher, but we're going to provide that additional value to you, which is more than value for the extra dollars. So there's several different ways that you can price it. Licenses and permits, it depends on your industry. Google your industry and licenses or permits, and it'll tell you. If you're in the construction area as we were, you had to have a contractor's license. 
And before you could do anything in any of the communities, you had to have a permit from that particular community. Other businesses, no. So it just depends on your industry. Okay, we've talked about business administration. Let's touch on taxes just a little bit. Taxes are a bugaboo for a lot of people. Specifically, you have to register for various things. I talked about the EIN number, easy to do. Here's the link to go do that. And there's even a tutorial on YouTube in terms of how to do that. So you can walk through that, but it's, it's not complicated. There's also a B10, which is in up until January, or correct, July 1st of last year, it was called a CRS number, which was a combined uh, reporting system number that the state had for their gross receipts tax. Why do they call it a gross receipts tax? Really, it's a sales tax in another parlance. Specifically, a sales tax is a tax that the customer has to pay uh, for whatever they buy, and that sales tax goes to the state. This gross receipts tax, the state says, I don't care who pays it. Uh, you can pay it as the business owner if you don't want to charge for it, but somebody's going to pay for it. So in my case, I have a little consulting firm, and the consulting firm, I don't charge some of the people gross receipts tax, so I have to take that out of my pocket and pay for that uh, to the state. State wants you to take sure, make sure that you charge or pay for that sales tax, and that sales tax is determined based on the community in which the, the benefit of that product or service is provided. So they provide you, once you get your B10 number, which is a business tax identification number, then they will provide you sheets of paper that provide you, says, okay, here's the tax for Corrales, here's the tax for Albuquerque, here's the tax for Las Lunas. And then you have to fill out the form at the end of the period that you've arranged with them, either monthly, quarterly, or semi-annually, to pay that gross receipts tax based on the particular rate in that particular community. There's payroll taxes. I think if you've ever had a job, you obviously know you're paying Social Security and their payroll taxes. And specifically, it's like 15.3% that typically is split between the company you work for and you as an individual. If you're the company owner, you're going to pay the company side and your employee is going to pay the other half. If you're the only, if you consider yourself an employee, you're going to pay the whole 15.3% right there. There is federal estate and unemployment. It's a very small amount. If you ever run across the term FUDA and SUDA, federal unemployment and state unemployment, this is basically where people are unemployed and they get benefits. They collect a lot of that money from the employers. So get with your uh, accountant and take care, but it's, a, it's small dollars. It's not big dollars. How do you pay for this? Well, you know that this, the federal income tax, as we all know, is paid annually. But if you make enough money, you're going to pay quarterly uh, in advance, both for the federal and the state income taxes. You're going to pay quarterly if it's large enough dollars. But talk to your accountant in terms of that to begin with. Typically, annual reporting is all. Gross receipts tax, when you set that up, when you get your B10, your business tax identification number, they're going to ask you, are you setting it up for monthly, quarterly? Typically, they want you to do it monthly, but you can easily do it quarterly. Uh, because to begin with, you're not going to have a lot of money. If you start getting money, then you're going to start paying more often. We were paying it, you know, like uh, weekly because we had a lot of money coming in. They said, no, 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 I want my money now. So if it's large enough, you want to process. Local property taxes, I think, is if you're a homeowner, you well know that the local community, the county assesses your property taxes. If you have property in your business, the same thing applies, just like it's a house. It's just your property in your business. The B10 number, this is the back business tax identification number, which is your identifier for the state. Uh, you have to have it if you're going to do any business in the state. I've talked to people and say, well, we could kind of just skate around this thing. We just won't pay. It. Well, the problem with doing that is if you're small potatoes to begin with, you're probably going to be able to get away with it. The problem is if your business starts to grow a little bit and you become a bigger target, not only do they come back and say, where is the gross receipts tax? but you're gonna get nailed for all the back gross receipts tax and interest and penalties. And typically what I've seen is the tax penalty and interest is equal to the back taxes. So people who have not paid those taxes all of a sudden are faced with a gigantic business tax arrangement. Better to try to just go ahead and get set up ahead of time and just take care of it as you're going along. 
as I said, the seller is going to pay for it, even if you don't collect it, but 99% of the people are collecting it from the buyer. And as I said, it's based on the locality the, or community. And here's where you register for the B10 uh, for that. Okay, let's talk a little bit about financial planning and record keeping. Why in the heck do I need to do accounting in the first place? I mean, I, I just got this cigar box and I just throw receipts in there or the bills in there and that'll take care of it. Or my cash register, I'll just keep it in the cash register. I don't need to do that. Well, it turns out that, that if you would go to a football game, how comfortable would you be if they just had people running up and down the field and no scoreboard? How would you feel like, well, I don't know who's ahead, but hey, somebody, they're having a lot of fun. Well, you might have, you need to keep score on your games. You need to know whether you're making profits or losses. And if I'm losing money, I sure as heck want to know about it so I could quit losing money. And if I'm making a lot of money, I don't know, where am I making that money? Am I making it off of product, services, et cetera? And so you need it for uh, a number of purposes. We're going to talk about each of these. Uh, chart of accounts, revenue expenses, loss, credit cards. Let me talk about those now. The other reason you have to have it is you have to have it for taxes. Taxes, we're going to say, uh, let's go audit your books. You say, what books? Ah, oh, that's not going to go over. I better have a set of books. How do I keep the books? It's something called a chart of accounts. You need to talk to your accountant about this. And most software packages come with a standard set of accounts. Revenue, expenses, et cetera. But you may want to have a separate or special chart of accounts. What is a chart of account? It's the boxes that the money is kept track of. So, for example, in our case, we wanted to know is our products profitable or at loss? Is our service profitable or at loss? If our leases, we lease uh, equipment, is our leases making money or losing money? Is our monitoring? the, the uh, security monitoring, making or losing money. So we would know, and then we could say, okay, now let's take a few more boxes and say within the products, was this kind of product A making profitability? Category, for example, alarm system, of closed circuit television, camera systems, or card access system. So we would know whether we were making profits or losing money so that we could pay attention to where it was that that money was not coming in. Or if we say it had great profitability, then we wanna accelerate our efforts in that particular area. So a chart of accounts is very handy. Advantage is it gives you that capability to know where you're at, you have the capability of keeping score. The problem is the more boxes you generate, the more work it is to keep everything straight. But remember, if you just have one box and you throw everything in, you're never going to be able to pull it back out. It's a little bit like chocolate rebel cake. Once you mix that chocolate and vanilla, ain't ever going to separate out the chocolate. Revenue expenses, that's standard. How much money is coming in and how much money is going out? I have to have know that. And because revenue minus expenses is equal to profit or loss. So I'll know, am I making a profit? How much? Or if I'm getting my expenses is greater than my revenue, how much is the loss? Also, you want to set up for credit cards because so many people pay with credit cards and there's a lot of easy ways to do that. You go get a merchant account with a credit card company and you can do things like, and you've had it before, a, somebody comes to your house to take care of your furnace or your air cooler or the yard or whatever. They have a little device attached to their phone and they put your little credit card in there through your phone and it tells them, yep, you, you paid for it. So in a sense, the business gets the money right away. So that you have, don't have to, now you could pay a little bit for that, but that's the way people pay for those things. So make sure you have credit card arrangements. Let's talk about the forms, the business record keeping forms. Here is an income statement, and this is just a sample income statement. Okay. It's got money coming in, revenue, money going out, expenses, and operating profits, the difference between the two. They've broken out interest down here and to come up with the bottom line. So how much money is coming in? In this case, what they did is they broke out also cost of goods sold. You don't have to do that. This is just a, one of the ways that they did it. But the big thing is how much money is coming in? How much money is going out? Am I making a profit? And then some of my additional expenses. If you ever hear the term EBIT or EBITDA, 
Boy, you could really look smart if you know what that is. EBIT is earnings before interest and taxes. So operating profit here is earnings before interest and taxes. There are, and if somebody calls it EBITDA, all that is is earnings before interest, taxes, and depreciation and amortization. All that is is just taking your uh, capital expenses and depreciating and making that a charge to your business. So this is a way EBIT or EBITDA you really be smart if you do that. So, and people tell you that, hey, I know what that is. This is a income statement or what they call a P&L or profit and loss statement. It is set up by period of time. Could be annually, could be quarterly, could be monthly, but coming in, going out, much is left over. That's an income statement. There's something called a balance sheet. Balance sheet is balanced because what's on the left-hand side down here equals what's called on the right-hand side. Well, what's on the sides? On the left-hand side is what you own, what you own, and on the right-hand side is what you owe and the difference. In other words, your equity. So what's over on this side, assets, equals what you own, owe, and what you have as equity. This number equals this, therefore it's a balance sheet. But it is a snapshot at any one point in time. It's basically the financial temperature, in a sense, of the business. Banks go just ballistic if your liabilities, what you owe, are greater than what you own, and this is a negative. Uh, that's a no-no. So they want to see that as a healthy number down here. And then they say, hey, my risks are lower because these people have got money to operate on. Okay, budgeting. What is budgeting? Budgeting is no more than projecting. In other words, a budget is the very same thing format-wise as a profit and loss or an income statement, which looks backwards. In other words, how did I do over the past month, year, et cetera? But it looks forward and it projects ahead of time and guesses at what's my income going to be and what's my uh, cost going to be. We're going to use this in a fashion to figure out how much money do I have to have when I start the business. Project my sales and I project my revenue. You say, how in the world am I going to do that? Well, you start listing all the typical kind of costs you're going to have. Well, let's see. I'm going to have to have a building. So I got rent. Okay, now I got to have utility. Yeah. Okay, am I going to have to have a, a, a vehicle? Okay. And you start listing all of these things. You put down all your costs. Okay. I'm going to start selling. Okay. What kind of revenue do I expect? And you start putting down that. Well, it turns out that to begin with, most startups end up for the first series of months with losses. And that's how, how we're going to figure out how much money we have to have before we get started. How do we get that? We start looking, here's a form. And this is a very, very simplified spreadsheet. So all done here is just said, okay, here's my months, January through June. Here's my revenue, how much is coming in and how much is going out. So just small numbers, just for illustration purposes. First month, no money coming in. First month going out is $130. So profit and loss, so it's obviously a negative 130. And, I, and second month, I go, oh, I, I got $100 coming in, but my expenses were $160. So what did 100 and 160? Oops, I got a $60 loss. So the $130 and the $60 together is $190. So I had to have $190 before I started this business or else I'd go crash on the second month. Third month, I got $200 coming in and I only had $180. Ooh, I got a $20 profit. So my $190 that I had drops down to $170. And you can go on through. When I get to the point where the money coming in is equal to or greater than the money going out, it's called break even. So when I get to break even, all I do is I add up the previous losses, this 190 in this case, and I know that I had to have that 190 in hand before I open the doors. Now you got to have some contingency money because there are going to be things that you have forgotten about but you know that way to how much money I'm going to have to have. So the question is, where am I going to get that kind of money? Well, it turns out that Inc. Magazine, which is a magazine for small business, 
took a look at the 500 fastest growing companies in the United States, talked to the CEOs and said, where did you get your money to start with? And each of them said, here's where I got it. Well, by far, 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 the majority of them says I got it from savings and friends and family. They did not get it from the banks. They did not get it from investors. You got it from savings, friends, and family. I'm not suggesting you have to do that. I'm just saying that the majority, by far, 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 the majority of the successful ones got it that way. And then they had the company successful to where the company was kicking off cash and generating the cash. In our case, we put money into the business and we had to uh, and plow all the profits back into the company. And then when we really wanted to expand, we had to go out and get an additional source of money. So in our case, we ended up with a second mortgage on a house to get the cash to put into the business for the major expansion. And the business paid us back, obviously paid off the second mortgage. But there are other options. For example, if someone says, well, I'm going to do crowdfunding. Crowdfunding is fine. There's different forms of crowdfunding. There is a reward type, which you can say, hey, here's my business. And I'm going to give you a t-shirt or I'm going to give you a free sample of my product or whatever. And if you can find people that will give you the money, and there's sometimes that they will, if they believe in your particular business. There's also a debt of crowdfunding in which they will buy, in a sense, your debt, loan you money. And there's also an equity crowdfunding. In other words, they will buy your uh, equity. The latter is very complicated. Uh, crowdfunding requires an outside agency to help you. And I've talked to people and they said, crowdfunding is wonderful, but you got to figure on spending a huge amount of time. And I said, how much? Typically, what people talk about, people I've talked to say, you could figure on a couple of people almost working full time for a couple of months, full time, nothing but crowdfunding, because you have to generate it, you have to set it up, you have to go out and find the customers. Uh, and it is, it's complicated, but it could be rewarding if you want to go that way. But it's a very specialized. You could turn around, and as I mentioned earlier, if you had a subchapter S, say, I'm going to sell 10% of the company to Cousin Joe, and uh, that's my sale of equity. So Joe owns 10% of the company, and uh, at some point in time when I sell the company, Joe's going to get 10%. But Joe now is a stockholder, so you're going to have to have stockholder meetings and brief the stockholders on what you're doing. And if you ever sell more than 50%, it's been regularly known that the stockholders all get together and say, you know, I think we need a new CEO. I know, I know he started the company, but or she started the company, but I think we need a new CEO. You're out of a job because they have the majority of the stock. So if you sell the majority of the stock, they could control the company. for you. you can get loans. The problem is banks are not interested in loaning you money because they know that uh, statistics show that on the order of 80% of small businesses go out of business in five years. That's not a very good number for, for the banks. They don't like that. Now, they will loan you money if you have a lot of personal collateral. Hey, I got equity in my house or my car or, or whatever. Uh, yeah, I'll loan you that on that. And then you decide what you want to do with it, put it in the business or whatever. But loans are very tough to do. If you're in big time business, you can find private equity. How am I going to cover all this? My gosh, you've covered ideas, you've covered planning, you've covered as minister. How do I get this all put together? Well, one of the ways you can put it all together is to come up with a schedule of activity of events. How do I do that? You decide who is going to do what, by when, at what cost. How am I going to keep track of all that? Well, you set up the necessary steps, you set them up chronologically, and you're constantly updating. Here's an example just a spreadsheet. Put down all the steps I have to do. Who's going to take care of that? Once my plan start date, what's my completion plan and what's actual and what kind of cost am I going to have to have to, to take care of that? So you can put down all the steps. You can even prioritize them. You can put them in order of priorities or you can color code them by, you know, red is the ones I got to get done first or the highest priority, or I can do these in sequence, but I got to make sure I do the red ones uh, whatever sequence you want, but say, well, wait a minute, I can just keep this all in my head. Well, you're not going to do that very well because if you're going to forget some stuff and it's impossible for the brain to remember everything, so better to write it down. Let's take a look at summary of all of this. Specifically, if you take a look at the 
stand way back and take a look. Remember we said the heart of it is the customer problem. If the customer has a problem that you can solve, they're going to want to pay you to solve that problem. If there is no customer problem or opportunity, they're not going to give you any. Would you give somebody, somebody says, well, hey, I want $100. What are you going to do for me? Well, I don't know, but give me $100. Uh, I don't think so. Got a problem? Yeah, I got a problem. If I Can I solve it? Well, I'll try it. And would you give me $100? Boy, if you can solve that problem, I'm going to give you $100. That's where you want to go. Provide the solutions for the customer's problem. Make sure that you provide more value than what you get. And go out and find more and over uh, more customers. Always things I say is when you have a customer that says, hey, that's exactly what I need. The first question is, who do you know? Who do you know that has the same kind of problem? And you just keep asking that question. Who do you know? Who do you know? And you get yourself a number of customers and you get those customers very, very happy. Why? Happy customers talk to other people and they tell them, let me tell you what I just did. Or let me tell you the experience I just had. And that could be favorable or unfavorable for you. If it's an unfavorable experience, Katie bar the door because they're going to tell everybody and then say, don't go to this outfit. My God, they promised me they'd be over here on Monday and, and Thursday. I had to go rattle their cage and they said, well, maybe next week. No, no. Make sure you deliver on what you promise. You got to have passion and commitment. Remember I mentioned that thing about that success factor on the one pager, lower right-hand corner. If you have a success factor that is burning, you will have the passion and the commitment. If you don't have the passion and commitment, there's a lot of bumps in the road that'll throw you off track. And you can say, this is not worth it. You have to have something they'll pay for. You have to have vision and goals, but you have to have action plans. If you don't have action plans, all the wonderful intentions in the world don't amount to a hill of beans. You got to keep pushing, keep pushing, and that's deliver on all promises. If you promised A, you got to go outside of yourself to just make sure you delivered. And they're going to keep coming back to you. Make sure you comply with the legal requirements. A uh, quick illustration I should have mentioned was some people say, well, instead of employees, I'm going to call them all 1099s, and that way I don't have to pay this payroll taxes. They'll just take care of it themselves. IRS has got rules on 1099s versus W-2s, and you can get caught in that, and the payments and the interest and the penalties are horrendous. So if you have any question, talk to your accountant. IRS has got rules about that. If you start shading things, you'll end up either paying now or you'll pay in the long run. And if you pay in the long run, it's very costly. You got to be willing to start the business. I was a poster child for this. I did a lot of research. I said, okay, well, let, let's start the business. I never did until I got pushed. I had to start it because of a particular situation. And then I jumped and started. Standing on the side of the pool and watching the swimmer swim is maybe so partially enjoyable, but you can't learn to swim on standing on the side of the pool. What does it take? It takes a lot of effort. Business success is not a sprint, but a marathon. It's a full-time job and don't get caught in a race in the bottom. That means if I keep cutting my price so I can get the job, pretty soon you're priced out of the business and you're broke. Remember cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. You don't have the cash. You can't pay your payroll. You can't pay your bills and you're out of business. Don't use excuses. I've seen people, well, if, if this would not, no, no, no. Just get your head down, keep going. Keep delighted customers. Keep in touch with the customers. In our case, we keep them under the customers and we were satisfying their needs at the earlier point in time, but they said, I got a new need and you didn't come around. I was, yeah, we're here. Well, what's your new need? Oh, well, here's my new need. Oh, hey, let's try and from a, start all over again. And, and uh, we did that and came up with new solutions for their new problems, new money coming in. Timing. The, it, it, an outfit by the name of Idio, the CEO did a, a survey and said, what were my most successful businesses? And that were they the fact that I had the, you know, a super team of people? No, it wasn't that. Well, I had a lot of money. No, it wasn't that. He found out that timing was the ideal. So Facebook started at the right time when there was a need for and the computer capability and communications capability along at the same time. Amazon, right time. Google, right time. Because they, the computers and the software were all developed at a time when they could jump on it and hit it. Is your business the right timing? 
Is it the right location, et cetera? So think about that. Do I have enough capital, both for a startup? Because remember, we went through that uh, spreadsheet in terms of how much money do I have to have a startup? How am I going to get my growth capital? If all of a sudden people say, oh, this is great. I want you to give me 10 instead of one. How am I going to get the money? Just think about it. To avoid the high attrition, make sure you think about counselors or mentors, SBDC and others. The key is you got to go do it. You got to jump in the pool. Uh, an old story is there was five frogs on a log and three decided to jump in. How many were left on the log? Well, the mathematicians are going to say, well, well, five minus three, obviously there's two frogs left. The answer is there's still five frogs left on the log. Why? Three frogs decided to jump in, but didn't yet jump in. They just decided you got to actually jump off the log to make it happen. We got a few minutes here. We got five minutes left for questions. And while you're thinking of the questions, let me mention that there are some SBA resource partners in addition to SBDC being a resource partner for Small Business Administration. SCORE is one of them that I'm a member of. West, a Women's Business Center program. Uh, Agnes over there has a superb arrangement. Uh, off of uh, Broadway near uh, Lomas. And they have the advantage of having an incubator there. So they have offices that you can rent. Excellent program. If you're a vet, make sure you get a hold of Rich Koffel. Superb program. They have a wonderful thing uh, called uh, Boots to Business. And it's a whole training program. Excellent, excellent training program. So if you're a, if you're a vet, make sure you get a hold of Rich Koffel. But all of these, SBDC and others are available to make sure you are a success and all of us are available. Take advantage of that. And the SBDC does a fantastic job on training, counseling, et cetera. Make sure you talk to them. And particularly with regard to new training, they have got a list there, as well as the counseling. So let's go back to questions. Uh, Anna, I don't know if you've got, if anybody's kind of put any questions in the chat function or not. Yeah, I don't see any questions aside from one question, which is actually addressed to me, and that's okay. whether or not this presentation is going to be available to view on our YouTube page. And thank you so much for asking that question. Yes, it will be. I will go ahead and chat through that link right now for everybody. And we will follow up in an email with more information, including the on-demand link for today's presentation, the YouTube channel, and um, additional presentations that we'll be having here throughout the next couple of days. So thank you so much for your attendance. And Vic, Good. I know you've let got me, more to say, so I'll, let, let I'll, I'll, give it, I'll hand mention, it back over to you. Great, thanks. Let me mention one more thing, and that is we went through this pretty quickly because there was a lot of material. In the event, you say, wait a minute, that was just too doggone fast. Be sure you come back in April. Uh, the course is going to be offered again. I think it's 13th, 27th. It, check on the, uh, the uh, Small Business Development Center's website and re-register. And you can go through the same thing a second time. And you may be able to pick up more of it. Uh, and in the meantime, review the uh, slides. And that'll help in that sense. Also, if you know of anybody, I'm following my own guidance to you. If you know of anybody who is thinking about a business, just thinking about it, be sure you tell them to register for it because the cost is fantastic for them, for you obviously, uh, and tell them to register in April uh, for the April presentations. It'll be the same kind of presentation uh, on uh, the same kind of information. And uh, so come on back or tell other people about it and have them come on back because our objective is to help generate successful business people. You are the economy, and we want to see the economy in Albuquerque and New Mexico expanded. And that only happens when people hire people for jobs. You are the business owners that have the potential of hiring those people. So you are the business activity potential for the future. So we want to make sure that you're successful. Take advantage of all of the options that you have available to make sure that you hit that success. And with that, I'll say uh, thank you for attending. And uh, we're just about right on time at the end here. And uh, welcome you back if you come back. And otherwise, the best of success for the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. And as always, thank you, thank you, Vic.